the figures on the three the angels and the figures on the crash are all Napolitan from the 18th century with the original clothes, gold, silver, jewel, jewels. It's fantastic. If you have a chance oh, to yeah. come it's after Christmas. Thanksgiving. After, uh, after Thanksgiving, yeah. just before Christmas. Yeah. Oh, about a month. A month. Oh, God. Yeah. I think it's coming Good. again. You will be Europe, the USA at the end. The Middle East on the right and the Far East, Asia on the right. All right? Arms and armor have been the important in every civilization. Not only for war, but also for hunting, uh, state occasions, and for uh, parades. This is the Arms is the symbol of power. In this tour, you will see some works of art. You'll hear about them and about the kings and lords, aristocrats, sultans who own them. So we're going to start by something fit for a Renaissance prince. Wow! <laughs> is actually two helmets in one. The bottom one is made of steel of the type called salad, S-A-L-L-E-T. Salad comes from the Italian, celata, which means open face up, uh, helmet. If you didn't have the lion's head, you would see that it looks very much like this one here, okay? But in this case, it's covered with the lion's head, which is made of steel uh, and copper that has been gilded. Gilded or gilt is an expression you will hear over and over, means covered with gold. There are several techniques, but the one used for arms and armor generally was mixing ground gold with mercury, heating the copper, the metal, and that would drive off the mercury and the gold would adhere to the steel. If you look in the front, you will see that the face of the prince, Italian prince actually who wore it, would peer out from the mouth of the lion behind those glistening teeth. The metal has been painted red to simulate the tongue of the lion. Oh. Oh. This was made in the Renaissance. Renaissance means literally rebirth. Uh, the Renaissance is a period in which the artists were looking at the art and the values of Greece and Rome. Uh -huh. Lions have always meant, from antiquity, represented power, courage, justice. The lion heads were very popular in the Renaissance as a decoration for arms and armor. According to Greek and Italian, uh, Roman legend, Hercules, Hercules. Oh, Hercules. Yeah, he killed a Nemean lion. He was a monster. And the monster's skin was immune, was not hurt by man-made weapons, uh -huh. so he had to kill him with his hands. Then he skinned it off, and he wore the pelt and the head as decoration. Uh -huh. So maybe the Italian who was wearing this helmet saw himself as the new Hercules, uh -huh. protected uh -huh. from harm by his miracle power helmet. This is the only 14th century helmet made a lantica that is in the style of the heroes of Greece and Rome. 
and it's conceived, it's the only one in existence, and it's considered to be a masterpiece, masterpiece of early Renaissance goldsmith work. By the way, to create the face and the, the mane, he used a technique called repoussé pushback, also called embossing, embossing, which consists in hammering from behind the metal to create the lower relief. And look at the face. Very close chisel lines create the, feel, ah, the look of fur. Yeah, fur. And for yeah. the nose, wow. tiny punch dots. Oh. What do you think it would feel like if you touch it? from a helmet worn by an Italian aristocrat. Let's go see a saddle that a German aristocrat, a knight sat on. Saddle. Ah, saddle. Yeah, between the man and the horse. Yeah. Saddle is from the 1400s also. Uh -huh. About the same time as the helmet was made in Italy, this was made probably in Germany uh -huh. or in the Tyrol, which is part of Austria now. Uh -huh. It's made of bone plaques, probably the pelvic bones of a large cow. Mm -hmm. The understructure is made of wood and leather. Mm -hmm. Do you see the two openings, the horizontal openings? The large one is for the girth that goes around the horse. Mm -hmm. And the little one for the straps that go to the stirrups. We don't know if they, anybody actually sat on this mm -hmm. or it was just a ceremonial present. Mm -hmm. But if they did, they probably would be riding, standing up mm -hmm. by the position of the straps and resting on the cantle. The cantle is the two semicircles in the back. Cantle? Yeah, cantle. C A N T L E. Oh. You can see that it's carved in low relief uh, and originally it was painted. You can see the colors, they still you can see a little green. Remember this is 500 yeah, yeah. years old and a little, little, little red and it's written in German, in German with a poem about one of the important things in the life of the medieval and early renaissance which is the search for courtly love ideal love ideal love there are about 20 of these saddles in existence by the way before that let me tell you uh, ivory was one of the uh, favorite objects in the middle ages and the early renaissance to create luxury objects uh, it was one of the favorite materials. In the 15th century, there was a shortage of ivory, which came from Africa, from elephant trunks. And so, uh, craftsmen had to come up with different materials that looked like ivory. So they started using horn, hooves, and even painted wood. Uh, all the 20 uh, saddles like this one are come from that, the center of Europe. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Black enamel. A stirrup is a tool attached to the back of the foot used by a rider to lead the horse either to go forward or to go sideways. Supposedly, the stirrups, they, there is a, some people believe the stirrups were invented by the troops of Julius Caesar See. because they wanted to direct the horse and have the hands free to fight. Mm. In the Middle Ages, the stirrups had a prong with a point. It was called a prick stirrup. In the early Renaissance, they came up with a rowel stirrup, which is a wheel that they turn, and it was not hurting the horse like mm. the other one was. This one looks like a sunburst, the decoration, the little rectangles, gold and enamel, tell us it belonged to the a very powerful family in the Kingdom of Aragon, which is now Northeast Spain, called the Urge Count. Now, has any of you heard the expression ever, 
earning one spurs. Earning one spurs? Earning one spurs. Or spurs. winning one spurs. Comes from the Middle Ages uh -huh. and it means a squire was a knight in training uh -huh. and he was allowed to wear silver spurs. If he was knighted by the king, then his life changed completely. Mm -hmm. He was allowed to wear gold spurs. He became an aristocrat, was given land, sometimes castles, and he became a nobleman ready to fight in battle for his lord or king. So next time, if somebody, which is not very likely, but if you hear somebody <laughs> saying that, now you know where it comes from. So, you've seen a, a helmet belonging uh -huh. to an Italian prince, a saddle of a knight, and a spur of a count. So now it's time to go to a key. I'm going to show you an armor. The armor's in existence. It belongs to King Henry II of France. You can, you're welcome to stay. Uh, it's made of steel that has been blued, gold, silver, and velvet. And the steel would start changing colors, go to brown, red, and end up in the favorite blue. For the regular soldier, the bluing was important because it helped prevent rust. But for a king whose armor was really well taken care of, it was basically a matter of fashion. It measures from the comb. The comb, like a rooster's comb, is the uh -huh. top of the helmet, to the sabatons or shoes, 74 inches, and weighs 53 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he was a tall man, Henry II, actually, for his time, he was a very tall man. Now, look at the decoration. It's made just like the helmet we saw in the repoussé technique, hearing it from behind. Mm -hmm. uh, it's full of uh, plants, uh, figures, animals, um, stories mm. from uh, mythological subjects. Mm -hmm. For instance, look on the right, do you see Apollo? Apollo? He ah. is running after Daphne. Ah. She is a nymph and he's in love with her. And do you know what happens at the end? She doesn't like him, so she becomes a tree. She becomes uh, a tree. Yeah. <laughs> he has killed a monster. Do you see the python? Do you see the snake? The yes, super big snake, snake yes. that he has just killed? Okay. So let's go back to the front. Wow, beautiful. Yogi, you velvet to Yeah, I guess. How <laughs> so. And here in the center, do you see the, the figure of a man, an old Roman warrior? Roman warrior? Do you see him? right on the center? Do you see the man with the beard? Yeah. He is not a real man. He's a personification. Personification means giving a humanly body to an idea. That comes from the Greeks and the Romans. Think of Cupid. Is Cupid a real boy? No. Or is he the personification of something? So, the same thing. This guy is the personification of triumph and fame. Do you see the two women kneeling down below him? One is giving ah. him a scepter and the other is giving him a sword. Ah. The scepter, fame, the sword, triumph. It refers to his achievements, military achievements. Ah. Um, what else can I tell you about this? By the time this armor was made in the, about uh, 1555, armor as a means of defense was going out of style. Gunpowder had been, was being used in war. And for an armor to be able to withstand uh, gunpowder would have had to be so thick that would have been impractical. But they kept making armors because now they had become jewelry for men, a way to show wealth and status. Henry II needed armor for uh, battle, for state occasions, for hunting, uh, for anything jousting. He had a whole armory going just for him with um, 
craftsmen, armorers from uh, Flemish, from Holland, Netherlands, France, and Italy. He has the doubtful honor of having been the only European king who died in a joust. Joust? Yeah, a joust. A joust is um, a competition between horses. You've seen in the movie. They have ah, answers, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's a very interesting. Well, I don't know. I, I will say that. <laughs> he was married to Caterina de' Medici from Italy. Caterina de' Medici had a personal oracle who was Nostradamus. You've heard of him? Nostradamus supposedly said the king was going to die in the joust. Oh. So she forbade all jousts. But her daughter, his daughter was marrying the, king of the, the daughter of the king of Spain. Uh -huh. No, actually, sorry. His son was marrying the daughter of the king of Spain. They, they had to have celebrations. Yeah. He, they had jousting, he insisted, and his opponent's lance broke on his shield, on the, uh, on, the, yeah, on, the on the on the face mask, and a splinter went in the eye, and he died 11 uh, days later. Uh, yeah. I will listen to his wife. He was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's funny because, well, not funny, but the pe fellow who killed him, not meaning to, was uh, the captain of his Scottish guard, the Count of the Earl of Montgomery, who asked him for forgiveness, and the king said, it took him 11 days to die, so he had time to say, Don, it's not your fault, you did what you had to, it's just bad luck. But his wife, Caterina de' Medici, waited. Vengeful, huh? The vengeful. He knew things didn't look good after the king died, so he moved to his state far away, but, and became a Protestant, so that was the excuse she needed to be had. Be had. Oh. Yeah. So, if you want to, that's the way he looked like before oh. he died. So, I have a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of uh, the holes in all the harness, and look at the horse. He is showing here that he is controlling the horse uh -huh. just like he controls his troops. There are 20 original designs show, showing what the armor is going to look like. This is one of them. Come here. Who was who wore this? Oldest, three or four, five, maybe. You got it. <laughs> he was five years old. The year is 1712. The most powerful king France has ever had, Louis XIV, gives this as a present to his five-year-old great-grandson. Mm. His name is Infante Louis. Prince of Asturias. That means Infante, he's the son of the king. A prince of Asturias is the title given to the future king. He was going to be the king, the first born in Spain, Bourbon king. Bourbon is the royal French right. family, as you know. Uh, this armor is made also blue steel and velvet, and it has the original red red silk lining from 1712. Look on top, all those rivets, gold rivets, do you see a lion in them? Yeah. Mm, yeah. That represents the Spanish kingdom of Leon. Do you see a tower? Yes. Yeah. Which means a castle, represents the kingdom of Castile. And do you see the three leaves? Right. That's the, from the century, 10th century, is the symbol of the kings of France. Mm -hmm. Although he was going to be the king of Spain, his great-grandfather wanted to make sure that everybody knew he came from royal blood. So if you count them, there are many more fleur de lis than there are lions or castles. Even look on top of the helmet. Do you see a big flower? You see the big flower behind the armor? You could see the name Drouard, 1712. Drouard was one of the last French armorers 
working in Paris. This is considered to be the last royal armor ever made in Europe. Mm. And there is one more material in this armor. Inside the lining, there is a French newspaper from 1711 with a lottery ticket. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How he got there, nobody knows. But <laughs> it is there. It's still on the inside? It is still on the inside. It's going to be on the how about for Halloween? Sure, I guess. So imagine if your dad, your grandfather, your uncles, everybody went to war with something like this, and you were five, and you were like ready to go to war? That must have really been something, no? You would be kind of proud to wear it, don't you think? Mm -hmm. And people would look at you and say, whoa, look at this guy going to war, and he's only five? <laughs> You'd be like a hero. Now. You saw the personification of uh, triumph and fame. Now, what I'm going to show you could apply to the manufacturer of the next object. Let's go to the US. Oh, yeah. Percussion revolver. The percussion cap replaced the flintlock mechanism with a one much more uh, reliable system. The gun is made of steel, gold, and wood. Some of the figures have been placed in relief. You can see like they stick out the gold as if it were, they were like tiny sculptures. Just like in the weapons of Catherine the Great, looking at these, you know where were they made, in whose factory, who patented it and in what country they it was made. So, if you're tall enough, you can look, otherwise <laughs> you can kind of get a little bit up here and look on top of the barrel. Ah, the name? Can you see? Sam, Sam Colt. Yeah. Sam and Colt. If you look here, uh, I, I need my glasses. Cold you can see patent. the pattern, called patent, right? right. right? And then you That's see George Washington? The, the words G. Washington. Uh, uh huh. So, you know in what factory they, um, they were made? Uh huh. Uh, who patented it? Uh huh. And then what country? Uh -huh. You see the face, the image of George Washington, and look at the left. What is that? Here, see if you know what this is. What Do you is see that? an eagle? Yeah. The what do you think United that is? States, I think. Eagle? 13. Now, Symbol of US. Um, this uh, weapon is from 1853, oh, yeah. and this was part of a group that in 1954 Samuel Colt took with him to Europe. It was the beginning of the Crimean War in Europe, which had placed Russia against Turkey and its allies, France and Germany. He first traveled to St. Petersburg, met with Nicholas II, the Tsar, and gave him one like this as a present. Mm -hmm. In exchange, the Tsar bought 45,000 guns from him. <laughs> then he traveled to Constantinople, to mm -hmm. Istanbul, and went to see the, Tur the, the Sultan of Turkey, who gave him this gun, and he bought like 45,000. So, <laughs> like he, worked, uh, yeah, he worked both sides very successfully. Actually, during the American Civil War, just both North and South were fighting with Colts. So, from here we're going to move on we're going to go to... He was the Earl of Cumberland and he was the champion of Queen Elizabeth I the Virgin Queen, and his supposedly the lover. The first, Elizabeth the first father, Henry VIII. Henry VIII, when he was young, and Henry VIII afterwards. <laughs> and it's kind of like watching him, right? Ah. It's kind of interesting. This helmet is from the 1400s Spain. Ah. It's of the type, the salad type, open face, like the first one we've seen. But before I tell you about it, uh, let me tell, go back in history for just one minute. 
the year is 772 AD. The Moors from North, North Africa, Berbers, uh, Islamic uh, group tribes, invade most of Spain. They destroy the Visigoths who lived in Spain, that civilization, and occupy most of the country. Kingdoms, Christian kingdoms from the north, start what they call the Reconquest or Reconquista, trying to push the Moors back to Africa. By, by the 1200s, the Moors have left, have been pushed out, except for the Kingdom of Granada, the Emirate of Granada in the south of Spain. There is a dynasty, the Nasrid dynasty, which from the 12th to the 1400s uh, rules Granada. In 1492, the same year America was discovered, Queen Isabel and Ferdinand uh, fight against him and send him into exile. This is from this period. It's made of steel, and the top is gold leaf. As you can see, there are some designs, pseudo Arabic calligraphy on yeah. top of it. There is a hole on the top. Do you see the round yeah. hole? Yeah, Which yeah. is for a feather, for a plume. Uh -huh. And the steel has been pierced to place more than a hundred enamels. These are cloisonné enamels. Uh -huh. uh, cloisonné comes from the word cloison, which means cell, C-E-L-L. -L. Because it's uh, made cell. by twisting little gold wires in this case and in laying uh, enamels on it. Uh. Every enamel comes with different designs and they are all evocative of the Nazarene Jew because the piercing probably uh, weakened the steel. This was a surgery. It's made of steel, and it's an elephant or tusk sword. These swords were placed, were placed on the tip of the elephant tusks for war. Look there. You see the design? Ah, oh, gosh. You know it? Wow. They came in pairs, and probably at some time there must have been thousands of them, but this is the only one of this type in existence. Ah. This is the only one in the world. In the world? In the world, yeah. Uh, <gasps> for a thousand years, in India, they were using elephants for war. So, from a sword used for war, let's see one for ceremony. I think you're going to like this one. The Indian I see you're putting on your glasses for that. <laughs> it's a saber. Saber means it has a curved blade. Ah. You can come in the, for, in the front and I'll show you something that many people didn't know for many years. I'll tell you what. It's made of steel, jade, emeralds, diamonds, pearls. Wow. It's, you could call it like a fusion of Islamic craft. Oh. The handle is made of jade from uh, jade from India, 18th century. The blade uh -huh. is 17th century Iran, Persia, and the sheath uh -huh. is from 19th century. All the decorations and the making is 19th century Turkey. On the blade, we see writing has to do with praising God, praising Allah, and also with Mohammed's soul. Unfortunately, the calligraphy is upside down. Oh. If you look at, the, at these other three sabers, it's upside up. Why is this one upside up, down? Because this is the way you would put it on. Put it on? Mm. Oh. Know what I mean? You have the right hand, and uh -huh. you put it on so it won't hurt the people who are behind you. That's the way you put it on. Mm -hmm. Very often you will see in um, Islamic uh, weapons, writings either from the Quran or incantations, sometimes as a talisman for good luck, others just as decoration. Arms and armor 
were central in the life of the Islamic countries, not only for conquest or for um, spreading the faith, but also as jewelry for men. Just like the armor we saw yeah. of Henry II, a way to show wealth and status. A crew of uh, armorers, jewelers, designers, uh, goldsmiths work together to transform everyday weapons into objects of beauty. Ah. This was used for the investiture of Murad V, Sultan of Turkey. Investiture for uh, Islamic countries was like coronation in Europe. You know, instead of a crown, it would be with a sword. Unfortunately, Murad V had a nervous breakdown before. So they put him in jail in the palace where he lived for the rest of his life. Now, not long ago, while cleaning the, the sheath, mm -hmm. the conservator of arms and armor saw a tiny hinge next to one of the emeralds. He pressed the hinge, it opened, and it showed, I'm going to move out, a secret compartment where there is a gold coin, it's called Sultani, uh, with the name of Suleiman the Magnificent, the most important of all rulers, Islamic rulers of the 16th century. Do you see that? Do you see? Ah. This Yoroi is from the 14th century, from the 1300s, and it's the only Yoroi of this kind outside of Japan, in the whole world. Oh. It consists basically of two pieces, the cuirass of body armor on the front, on mm -hmm. the top, which is tied on the side by a separate piece, I don't know if you see it, and of a skirt with four panels. Oh, there's separate panels. Do you see it? There's separate panels. Uh, if you look behind you, you will see these are revival armor, from uh -huh. the 18th century, made to look like the 14th ah. century ones. These uh, armor were worn by uh, samurai from samurai. the 12th to the 14th century. Samurai were on horse and they fought with uh, bows and arrows. Mm -hmm. The sword was only used for the final stages, when he was out of arrows. The sword became his last chance to save mm -hmm. his home, his family, and his country, therefore became the samurai's most precious possession, something that would go from generation to generation, never to be sold. The armor, while the European armor you see is made of steel blades to deflect blows, this is made of lamellar, L-A-M-E-L-L-A-R. Lamellar consists in small oblong pieces of lacquered iron to prevent rust and hardened leather, tied together, overlapping, tied together by laces, which makes for a very flexible garment. The reason the skirt is open in four places is because when the samurai sat on the horse, it would fall accordion style. Mm. And it would provide extra protection for the samurai. This is the only 14th century yoroi in existence in the world with the original silk lacing. Ah. Here, do you see on the cuirass, on the body? On the leather, there is a stencil figure. He is ah. Fudo Mio. Fudo Mio is a Buddhist god. Uh -huh. He is known, he's like the Saint George for the Western world. You know, Saint George and the dragon, that one. And he is shown with a sword on the right hand to cut down ignorance. On the left, he has a rope to ensnare devils and also to remove obstacles. Very often you will see him surrounded oh, by flames. Flames destroy anger and pride and return purity of mind.
to the warrior. Some of his uh, qualities are calmness, and even if he looks like he's not calm, if you go to the second floor to the Japanese galleries, you'll see a lot of food on meals. And he looks really scary. One eye looks to the heaven, the other to hell, ah. the teeth. But his attributes mm -hmm. are calmness and strength of mind, which were very appreciated by the samurai warrior. Ah. This yoroi was actually used in battle ah. by a shogun. Uh -huh, by a shogun. shogun, the word means show, commander, gun, troops, military. Both together mean supreme commander. Uh -huh. His name was Ashikaga Takauchi. He was the founder of the Ashikaga shogunate that uh, ruled Japan for 200 years. Uh -huh. Hello to my video. Hi. What's your name? Oh Isabel. Isabel입니다. Isabel. Isabel입니다. 엄청 설명을 잘해주셔서 진짜 감동받았어. Oh, you're Japanese. Not Korean. Oh, you're Korean. Oh, sorry. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> nice thank you. you. You're Spanish. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank yeah. you. This is so nice. Bye bye. 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 여기서 만난 중국 분이신데 가이드를 하신대요. <웃음> 같이 투어 듣고 있는데 제가 좀 어, 놓친 부분들을 설명해 주고 계세요. 그리고 예 지금은 하이라이트를 보여주는 투어를 참여할 예정입니다. 한 시간 동안 진행되네요. 졸지 말아야지. <웃음> 여기 이집트관 장난 아니에요. 와 진짜 멋있다. Here alone in its own vitrine, which should tip you off right away to the fact that this is really a treasure in this collection and actually in the uh, art history of the Greek world itself. This is a vase made out of terracotta and it was produced in the 6th century BC, about the center of the century. And terracotta means baked clay. It's a very fine quality clay that exists around the city of Athens in Greece today. And uh, but where you see the orange, you are looking at the underlying clay. Where you see the colors, the black and the white, you're actually looking at a glaze that was applied by the artist. This is a black figure vase, and we're going to be getting into the subject in a moment. But one of the things that makes this very special is the fact that it has its lid. Only about 2% of the ancient vases have come down to us today with their lids still intact. So this is wonderful because it's exactly as it left the artist's studio, which brings us up to the subject of who the artist was, and he was Ezekias, the greatest of the back black figure vase painters. Black figure simply means that the figures are painted in silhouette, and all of the details have to be left unpainted. So where you see orange colors through here, you're looking at areas that were not applied with paint. And just to give you an idea of how difficult this wit was, the, what they were using as paint material was actually just additional sand that was thinned out with more water. So you are applying an orange moist material onto a bisque colored orange material. In other words, you're painting orange on orange. The only thing that would differentiate the two is the fact that your, your glaze is a little bit shiny. Having said that, <clears throat> I want to draw attention to the handle of the uh, top of the vase. That is a pomegranate, and this was a very important symbol to the ancient Greeks because it was a symbol of both birth and death, so it represents the life cycle. And whenever you look at Greek art, there's usually some, at least one, but often many, many references to the life cycle. The main scene is right here, and it gives you an idea of what an extraordinary artist Ezekias was then and it still is considered to be today. This is a very complicated scene, but it has been arranged in such an organized fashion that it looks extremely easy for us to read. This type of vase is known as a neck amphora, and ordinarily it would be a little bit narrower than this. But because he knew what he was going to paint, he wanted a wider vase. 
And interestingly enough, Exequius was both his own potter and his own and the painter. That gave him complete control over the entire artistic process. And we have a scene here, as I said, that's quite complicated. Unfortunately, we don't have any historical records as to what it's uh, commemorating. Exequius in his lifetime would have been such a revered individual that to uh, commission something from him would have been very expensive. And it's quite likely that this was used strictly for ceremonial purposes. It was perhaps given as a gift and then never used for every day but for ceremonial, which is one of the reasons it, why it may be in such good condition. But let's come to our scene. Over here on the left, we are looking at two figures. Can you see? Come around. Everybody line up where you can see what I'm talking about. Just don't take it for granted that I'm describing what's there. Um, all right, we have our two figures in the chariot. Now this is very interesting because we have never excavated a single chariot part in Greece let alone a whole chariot. There was one partial chariot part found at one point, but it actually it was imported from somewhere else. It wasn't of Greek origin. So it raises the question of how many chariots did they really have. But we have our two figures in the chariot. A chariot is a lightweight vehicle. It has two wheels and one axle. It, it does not require a lot of strength to pull. We actually have a Roman chariot, Etruscan chariot actually, upstairs on the mezzanine. If you're interested, you can come back and go up to the mezzanine and you can see by looking at it that it would have been fairly light. All right, so we have a third figure standing in front of those two and you'll notice that two of these figures have pale complexions. These are the women. For some reason, and again, we don't really know the historical reason, the Greeks began to portray women as having paler complexions than men. And that has persisted until today in Western art. It's very funny to me to see, oh, uh, a 17th, no, 19th century painting of pe uh, peasants out in the fields harvesting, and you'll see that the women have paler complexions here on the, under the same sun. So anyway, we have our third figure, a woman. In front of her is a dark figure, a male. And you'll notice that over his head, you can see two long wood, white, they're actually boards. It's part of a musical instrument known as a kithara. The kithara was a very important instrument for the ancient Greeks. We don't know how it sounded because we don't know how their music sounded, but we do know that it was very important. It was the instrument of Apollo, the sun god. In addition, under the belly of the horses, you see some decorated fabric hanging down there. Those draperies are tied onto the kithara, indicating that this man has competed and is considered a master kitharist, a kithara player. In front of him, we have a number of horses and then a small figure, probably a cupbearer or a groom or something, but he's leading this procession. Now we come to the question of the horses, and this is not a trick question, just count the front legs. How many horses do we have? Oh. Yes, well, how many do you think it would take to pull a chariot? One. Two. One, would, one could do it, a large dog could do it, actually. <laughs> Dogs are the strongest draft animals on earth. They pull 47 <laughs> times their own weight, which is why I, I look at some of these dog walkers around here, and they holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> Those are little dogs, though. No, a lot of them are big dogs. <laughs> Okay, so we have four horses. Right there, we're looking at a status symbol because only 16% of the land in Greece is arable, farmable. Therefore, large pasturage that you are required for cattle and horses simply doesn't exist. If the Greeks ever used horses and chariots in warfare, it would have been the Trojan War, which brings up another point. But anyway, we have our four horses here. One of those horses is completely white from the tips of its ears to the bottom of the hooves. In nature, there are no white horses, they are gray. <clears throat> but nevertheless, we have an all white horse and that's a tip because this horse has been made very prominent. We see the two black horses in front and then the black horse behind the white one. Now, horses were very valuable and very rare and they were thought of as synonymous with gods and goddesses, military heroes, and the very small aristocracy in that order. Who is controlling these four horses? Read backwards. To who's holding the reins? It's the woman. So that tells us right away that we're looking at a goddess, not a mortal. 
So no <coughs> Greek citizen would have been driving horses. Therefore, now we, we know we're probably onto some kind of myth because we have a goddess. In addition, by looking at this carefully, it resembles a wedding procession. The bride and groom would be married early in the day in the bride's family's house. L later, usually around twilight under uh, torchlight, they would process to the streets, parade to the streets, and take up residence in the groom's house. So that is what we seem to be looking at, and they're accompanied by a musician, which not only indicates this is an important wedding, but it indicates some uh, another godly uh, uh, reference point. So the only th thing that we have been able to figure out so far is that we are probably looking at a wedding scene of Peleus, the beautiful sea nymph, and uh, I mean, Thetis, and Peleus is the, is the man, the man uh, who was the grandson of Zeus, the head of the Greek pantheon. Now, if it's a wedding, this is very important because their wedding started a chain of events that ends in the Trojan War. What happened that started this? Well, one goddess was not invited to the wedding party, the goddess of discord. So here we go. So many, many years later, when their first son, their only son, Achilles, <clears throat> was born, he will become the hero of the Trojan War. So we're probably looking again, Thetis and Peleus and the beginnings of the Trojan War. This fits perfectly with what we do know about Ezekiel. He was fascinated by scenes from the Trojan War and even created scenes that were not described in the poetry of the day. So any questions about this? Yeah, what, what's the relationship in time between... What has happened here? is the mantle, if it even existed on the original piece, uh, would, has been dropped even lower. So what, that means that the marble is still there, it's just been carved. And then the marble down here, which is still attached, is, has been carved into a tree trunk. This is called a strut, and it gives added strength to that part of the statue. In addition, between the calves, between the thumb and the forefinger, and between the thigh and the wrist, we see marble that has been left in place to give strength to the piece. All of the back fingers were broken at one time. In the 19th century, they were replaced. This hand was completely missing in the 19th century, and someone, not us, we do not do that kind of restoration, but someone uh, carved another hand and put it on here. But that wrist is exactly the kind of break that you expect in marble. You get to the thinnest point. Marble has a very definite grain. It's a form of limestone or sandstone. It has a very definite grain and has very large pockets of air in it. So a real problem. So that's what happens to your composition. When you are admiring Roman reproductions of Greek originals, you might want to think back to how much freer the original might have looked in bronze because it did not require these kinds of supports. Yeah. Okay? And you were saying there's only like 200 of the bronze statue only. left? Only. No, the all over the world. Why? Why? Did you know Africa? Okay. Africa We've moved into Africa. Africa. We've actually moved to the modern uh, nation of Nigeria on the northwestern uh, coast. But what we're really looking at in all of the vitrines around us, and this one in particular, is uh, objects from the Kingdom of Benin. The Kingdom of Benin still exists today. It's within the Republic of uh, Nigeria. The difference being that the people of Benin are a different ethnicity than many of the other groups around them. This is an ivory mask, meaning that it's the face of a woman. As you can see, the image is the face of a woman. Uh, an ivory mask, and it's known as a pendant because there was a companion piece, another mask, which we do fortunately have. It's in London at the British Museum. I have seen them side by side. They, they're not twins, but you can tell they're intended as a set. So ivory, face of a woman. We have a very intelligent looking woman looking straight out of us. And let me tell you, this is patterned after a, both a real woman. She was the queen mother during the first half of the 16th century and she's also an icon within the culture today. We'll come back to her story later. You can see two beautification marks between the eyebrows. At one time, these were set with either metal or jewels. We don't know which, but they would have been very shiny. You can also see the pupil of her left eye is still in place over here. 
it's her left eye, but it's on your right side. Mm -hmm. And you can also see a wire under the eye. At one time, it was an eye wire both above and below mm -hmm. each eye for eye makeup or eye uh, lashes, something of that type. <clears throat> She looks very intelligent, she looks very much in control, very regal, exactly as we would expect the queen and the, later the queen mother to look. Under her chin, she's wearing what appears to be a sweater, a turtleneck sweater, but actually it's individual strings of beads. Within the culture of Benin, they thought of the gods of the sky and the gods of the sea dominated the universe. And Coral was considered a very important uh, object from the oceans, and therefore coral was very prized for this kind of bead. But something very interesting happened to the Kingdom of Benin. In 1485, the Portuguese arrived. The mm -hmm. Portuguese arrived by ship, so this was seen by the people of Benin as a gift from the sea, uh, the sea gods to them, because the Portuguese were looking for a steady trading partner for tropical products, uh, specifically ivory and a plant known as melagueta, which produces something that looks like and tastes like peppercorns. It's not even related, but spices commanded such high prices in Europe, and so did ivory, that these were the types of products they were going for. So um, with these made, one of the things that they first traded to the people of Benin was glass and crystal, because they did not have the raw materials or the technology for producing glass or, or crystal. They were, however, extremely adroit with metal, as you can see back here, and in the cases behind you, there are many objects in metal. And these plaques, made exactly the way that the Artemis was that we were just looking at, uh, were used to decorate the palace walls and uh, pillars inside the palace. They, it was a very large city. Europeans were very impressed at the size and the grandeur of the city, and the palace was right in the middle of it. Coming back to our queen, Portuguese, something very interesting is going on around her head and then around her chin. And that is two symbols that became very important to the Portuguese, especially in the 16th century, which was their golden uh, era. Just above each ear, you see an ornament, but above the ornament, you are looking at a head. Where it's pointed towards the queen's hair, you're looking at the goatee of a Portuguese. And where it's rounded away from her head, you're looking at a hat. So we have a Portuguese on either side. Next to the Portuguese is a fish, and it's bent over. So what we're looking at are the tail fins and the snout away from the queen's head, and the curved belly is against the hair. So Portuguese mudfish, Portuguese mudfish, Portuguese mudfish. Why? Well, now let's start with the Portuguese. First of all, they were not revered. They were not thought of as gods. They were simply thought of as traders who would come and help to make the people of Benin wealthy. But nevertheless, the head of Portuguese, anything related to the Portuguese, was adopted and then adapted to be a symbol of this wealth-bringing relationship. The mudfish is another very interesting subject. Mudfish. Uh, in Nigeria, it's about three and a half feet long. It's much longer in South Africa. It is equipped with a complete set of gills. That's hardly a surprise. It's a fish, but it has a complete set of lungs, and it can live for years out of water. Wow. So this becomes a survivor in difficult conditions, changing climates, changing whatever, a need to change foodstuffs. The mudfish is a symbol of the king, because the king was thought to be half divine and half human being. It's also a symbol for warriors going into battle of survivorship. However, it's not revered so much that they don't eat it. It's actually a very prized uh, food fish as well, both in Benin and also in Europe, where it's known as lungfish. So we have these figures repeated all around. Again, symbols of the queen's power and the fact that she's controlling this trade trading relationship. Her name was Idya, and she was known to be an extremely shrewd businesswoman and to be very diplomatic and very good at business negotiations. As a result, her son, the sitting king, gave her a vote on the Council of Chieftains, equivalent to what all of the chiefs had. And to this day, 
the Queen Mother still sits on that board and has one vote along with everyone else, which gives you an idea of how she became an icon within the culture. Mm -hmm. Images of women are almost unknown in Benin art, but we have five masks of this woman alone. Mm -hmm. So it gives you an idea of how important that she was. Now, how are they used? That's an interesting question. We have no idea in the 16th century and neither do the people of Benin. But we do have 19th century photographs that were taken of the king during ceremonies. And we see him in ceremonial robes with one pendant at his uh, shoulder and one pendant at the hip holding the, the uh, textile together. However, it's also been suggested because of the way the back is carved that these might have been worn in the front and in the back as a protector of the chest and the back of the mm -hmm. king. So we really don't mm -hmm. know. But the mudfish is very interesting. If you want to see a mudfish, here's one right here, or two actually. Gives you an idea of what ah, you're looking at. Fish. See the snout and the tail bent over, you're getting those three points away from the queen's head. Here we have two completely armed and armored soldiers and you notice what's next to each of them oh, symbol of the king and a symbol of surviving as well oh. and up here we have some of their very playful images of portuguese <laughs> so, and even i mentioned the concept of 